This story is brought to your ears by all our fantastic supporters on Patreon. To get on the action yourself with bloopers, extras, and the occasional early story, join us at patreon.com slash voiceofallmtg. We'd like to thank our newest patrons, Yes Mountain and DM, for already donating. For more stories, or just to chat, visit voiceofallmtg.com. And now, Voice of All presents The Arbiter of Law Left Chaos in His Wake Episode 3 of the Rivals of Ixalan Saga Watley swore through her teeth as she took off through the jungle toward the distant golden walls of Arazka. She could barely make out Angrath's lumbering shape cutting a line through the thick of the rainforest ahead, and in the periphery of both sides, she saw a flash of familiar silvery scales. Stop right there! Watley's eyes flashed a warm amber as she gripped the air with her fist. A half second later, a massive dinosaur bounded into view. The dinosaur rapidly closed the distance between itself and Nangrath, then effortlessly bowled him over and trapped him underfoot. The minotaur roared in frustration, and Watley goaded the dinosaur to roar right back. Nangrath went quiet. He was panting heavily and grunting under the dinosaur's weight. Do you have him under control? An elderly voice from behind Watley. Tishana was walking forward through the thick of the rainforest, a sly grin tugging at the corners of her mouth. Behind her, Watley saw the silhouettes of dozens of merfolk standing at the ready. Watley nodded. Yes, I do. Thank you, Tishana. Tishana shifted from one foot to the other. Watley calmed her racing heart. She wondered if the merfolk elder might race off again, and was half certain she should leave Angrath under her dinosaur's foot and join the merfolk if Tishana did make for the city. Is our agreement off, then? Tishana shook her head. I assembled my clan. Our agreement stands. Now that the city is awoken, it is a beacon. Others intend to assemble, drawn by its light. Much as you are. Little Moth. Wally blinked through another wave of headache. The moth metaphor did not sit well with her. Deshana approached, concerned. You are unwell? Wally shrugged it off. I'm fine. The closer we get to the city, the more my head hurts, is all. You and the pirate drift on similar currents. What do you see when you glimpse beyond our veil? My chain in your face! Wally flicked her wrist, and her dinosaur shoved him deeper into the dirt. She turned back, ignoring Angrath's muffled yell in response. I hear stories from other worlds. Tishana laid her hand on Watley's shoulder. Her face was serene and kind, the very soul of wisdom. Then we should make certain you get to hear them in full, warrior poet. Wally's heart caught in her throat. She kneeled next to Angrath, who was still trying to wriggle his way out from under her dinosaur's foot. Angrath, I'm sorry, but I need to go with Tishana. We had a deal first. Angrath tried to yell at her through a face full of loam. Watley laid a hand on her dinosaur and gave it a brief command. You'll be let out in 30 minutes. I'm sorry. Watley whistled, and a snubhorn trotted out of the rainforest toward her. She climbed on its back with ease and took off alongside Deshana before she had to listen to any more of Angrath's furious, indistinct objections. Deshana caught up quickly, riding the same elemental as before. Time stretched as they approached. The spires grew closer, the sun creeped higher overhead. Watley maintained a quick pace to keep ahead of Angrath, well aware that danger lay both behind and ahead. The gold of the city reflected the light of the sun and the heat that came with it. And after some time, Watley blinked sweat from her eyes as she passed through the gates of the Golden City. Arazka was magnificent, a packed cityscape of shining walls and immense carvings. Watley had wondered if it would feel like coming home, but it felt instead like visiting a distant relative. It was familiar, yet alien. 
a place for her, and yet not where she ought to be. Tishana and Huatli pushed forward along the main thoroughfare, past an endless array of alleyways and side streets. The walls were high, but far ahead they could make out a central building, and Huatli knew in her heart of hearts that she was somehow fated to enter that building. Out of the corner of her eye, Huatli saw Tishana point skyward. The sky had turned as dark as river shale, and thick clouds were rising from the main spire of Arazka like smoke from a bonfire. The sight of it filled Watley with dread. What is happening? She asked over the sound of her mount stomping on the pristine golden tiles of the plaza in front of the tower. The tower ahead seemed to be staining the sky in inky black. Watley gasped as she saw a body start to fall from the top of the tower. No! Watley felt an immense wave of magic as Tishana slapped her outstretched hands together in front of her. The body's descent slowed, then stopped altogether as a massive gust of wind rose up to break the fall, and a blanket of dust and leaves settled around the person who had fallen as they slowly came to rest on the ground. Tishana's elemental took off toward the tower, leaving Watley on the far side of the plaza. Wally called out to Shana's name, but her voice was drowned out by the stampede of merfolk who all ran to surround Tashana and the body. Wally urged her mount to run forward. Her dinosaur's footsteps pounded a quick rhythm against the gold tile of the ground, slowing as they approached the crowd of worried merfolk. Wally prepared for the worst. As a warrior, she was no stranger to gore, naturally, and girded herself for a grisly sight. But the body in front of her was largely unscathed, save for a smear of blood under his chin. Watley dismounted and approached. Tashana was whispering to the man on the ground as several other merfolk worked a healing spell on him. Kumena, we're here. Who is in the tower? The merfolk on the ground fluttered his eyes open. His skin was less opaque than it ought to be, and as he lifted his head, a trail of blood flowed from his mouth onto his chest. Who do you think? Wally scowled. The pulse of dark magic above her could only mean that the Legion of Dusk had taken control of the Immortal Sun. And thus, apparently, the city along with it. Tishana gave a brief order to the merfolk at her side. And then she looked back at Wally. We can take them together. We will resolve ownership of the city from there. Wally smiled. A distant noise caught her attention. In the grim overcast, she could just barely see a motley group racing toward the tower. A siren flew overhead. A familiar woman clinging to an armful of weathered canvas charged below, and in front was a scraggly and mad-looking goblin. The goblin waved a sword longer than himself in the air. He screeched with abandon as he charged. We want sun! We want sun! Pirates. The merfolk grabbed Watley by the shoulder and tugged her up the staircase inside. Hurry! Watley followed suit. Her footsteps pattered a steady rhythm as she raced up the tower. Tashana was close behind. She was clutching the jade totem that contained the elemental she had ridden in on. The staircase felt endless, and every few steps they could see a grim, imposing sky outside through a sliver-like window. Watley's breath was heavy with exertion, her heart furiously trying to keep pace with her feet. As they climbed higher and higher, she became more and more aware that she might not make it back home alive. At last, the staircase ended. A massive door at the top of the tower was ajar. The entryway was four times as tall as Watley, and for a moment she was dumbstruck, mouth agape, at the architectural majesty her ancestors had created. Villains! Tishana bound past Watley and into the chamber ahead. Watley watched as she threw the jade totem in first with one hand and began to awaken it with the other. Watley snapped back to the present. Marvel later. later. Kick, Kick the vampires, the vampires out, out now. She ran through the door and assessed her surroundings. The room was large and airy. It was, like everything else in the city, plastered with an ungodly amount of fine materials. But 
in this case built to surround a central piece in the floor. In the center of the room was a disc embedded in the jade of the floor. The disc was about as wide as Whatley was tall, and it glowed a chilly white blue under the feet of a menacing conquistador. A second vampire, Hierophant, she briefly remembered, was nearby, holding a staff out in challenge. I am Vona, butcher of Magan, and the immortal sun belongs to the Legion of Dusk. The woman in the center of the room cried out, and Whatley recognized her as the sweaty vampire from the jungle. Whatley glanced at what was beneath the vampire's feet and gasped was, inlaid in the glittering gold of the floor, as real as ever. The disc could only be the immortal sun. Polly gaped at it. They put it in the floor? Tashana had already chosen her target in the room. Her elemental had grown larger once more and barreled into Vona's side as she stood on the immortal sun. Polly locked eyes with the male hierophant standing near the edge of the immortal sun. He lowered his staff and bared his teeth, and Whatley attacked. She kept her center of gravity low as she cut straight across the room toward him. The vampiric priest clawed his hand in response and dove for her face, but Whatley dropped to her knees and skidded past, clipping his ankle with her blade as she slid on the cold jade of the floor. The hierophant snarled. Whatley grabbed his cloak and yanked him to the floor, and the crack of his head against the ground was alarmingly loud. Whatley pinned him down with her right hand and held her blade aloft in her left. Yo! Whatley looked up in surprise and was hit in the chest with a kick from the hierophant beneath her. Whatley landed on her back with a hard clang from her armor. She winced and then looked up and locked eyes with Zola. The conquistador smirked and held up a sharp nailed hand, ready to strike. I am the color of sinners and the conqueror of Orozka! Dark, scentless smoke billowed through the room, and Whatley cried out as a wave of pain racked her body. She clambered to her feet, but fell down again on hands and knees, her muscles quivering and her breath caught in her throat. Whatley looked at her hand and saw that it was purple and brown with what looked like living bruises. Terror filled her heart. Vona was using the immortal sun to manipulate her blood. Whatley tried to look for Tashana and saw the merfolk elder pulled to the ground by the Hierophant. Tashana! The exclamation was cut off by her own scream as a trickle of blood ran down her lips. Vona was laughing as she walked to the edge of the immortal sun closest to Whatley and knelt. <laughs> What's wrong? Are you uncomfortable? Suddenly, a song filled the room. It was a man's voice singing, melodic and soft. Wally froze, transfixed. She realized Vona had gone still as well, along with Tishana and the Hierophant. The song was beautiful, enchanting in a way she couldn't place. She had to go to it. She had to be closer to its source. Wally whipped her head around, stumbling out of Vona's clumsy grasp, even as the vampire also began seeking the source of the song. A figure was hovering just outside the window, flapping azure wings to stay aloft. All the while, he sang a tune more comforting than a lullaby, and more precious than a prayer. Vona, Tishana, and the Hierophant were making their way forward, jostling to get closer to the miraculous song. Vona shoved her way to the front, her eyes wide with desire. There, just hand spans away from the open window, was a feathered siren, the pirate from the belligerent, and clinging to his neck was a manic-looking goblin. Somewhere in the back of her mind, Whatley realized what was about to happen. The goblin leaped forward on Devona's face. Violence! The song stopped and the siren cheered. Go for the eyes, breeches! Watley snapped out of her stupor and tried to make a run for the immortal sun while Vona was screaming. 
The goblin was clawing and scratching at the vampire woman's face, laughing all the while. Just then, the floor shuddered, and Watley heard a loud banging noise. Everyone in the room whipped their heads around to find the source of the clamor. The golden doors to the room were lying flat on the ground, and standing above them, howling in rage, was Angrath. Wally recognized the smell of burnt meat, just as the Minotaur casually tossed her the charred head of the dinosaur that she had assigned to stand on top of him. The head hit the ground with a meaty slap. You are awful! You made your dinosaur stand on top of me! The Minotaur set his sights on the Conquistador with the goblin on her face. Angrath aimed his white-hot chains at Vona. The chains wrapped around Breaches, who screeched and swore as he was yanked backward. He immediately regained his footing and charged Angrath. As Angrath and the goblin scuffled, Watley looked for Tashana, who had just succeeded in binding the Hierophant with some vines growing from a crack in the ceiling. Tashana looked at Watley, and then looked at the immortal sun on the ground, and the vampire being dragged off of it. Watley looked at Angrath, who briefly glanced at Tashana and back at the sun. They all paused, and then moved at the same time in a mad scramble. All at once, Tishana dove forward and slapped her hand on the sun. Hotly kicked her foot out to touch its side. Angrath stomped into the center, and Vona slammed both hands down on top of it once more. The four of them gasped as an immense current of energy passed through them. Hotly laughed aloud at how wonderful it felt. Her perception spread across the city. Her soul spread thin and broad over the magic inlaid in the city of her ancestors. She suddenly knew every path, felt every current of energy, and sensed the boundaries of every building and the reach of every spire. But most wonderful of all, she perceived five immense heartbeats, one at each corner of the city. The elder dinosaurs have awoken. A tear ran down her cheek. The tale of the elder dinosaurs had taken the longest to memorize, an agonizing two years to lock in her mind in its entirety. They were ancient and wild, utterly untamable. The greatest of the dinosaurs. She called the elder dinosaurs to her and fell to the ground tremble as they began to approach. Wally's joy overcame her, and she continued to laugh. But there, just beyond the city's edge, she felt the footsteps of Emperor Apotsek's army. An army she had not asked for. Wally's smile fell. She felt stupid. She should have known he wouldn't just send her. She remembered where her body was, and brought her attention back to the room at the top of the tower. The immortal sun was glowing fiercely below the four of them. Angrath had one foot on the immortal sun, and one foot on the normal floor, and the magnified heat of his body had caused his other foot to sink through the gold. Tishana's feet were cemented to the immortal sun through a series of interwoven vines. Vona was scrambling, calling more dark smoke toward herself. Each of them readied a weapon, and their eyes darted from person to person. Wally gripped her blade and slowly stood tall. Her mind was buzzing with the energy of the city and the distant tug of the elder dinosaurs. She quietly assessed the threat posed by each foe. Vona was exhausted and could easily be disposed of. Tishana briefly glanced at her, but Wally couldn't read her intent. Angrath was seething, as always. The siren and the goblin breeches stood on the outside, clearly wanting the others to battle it out so they could swoop in like the pirates they were. The hierophant remained secure to the walls with vines. Wally crouched to attack. She locked eyes with Tishana across from her and nodded her head slightly toward Vona. Tishana almost imperceptibly returned the nod, and Watley prepared to pounce. Suddenly, the siren and goblin both gasped. They looked at each other with wide, confused eyes. Malcolm, you heard Jace too? Jace? The telepath? The siren nodded, afraid. 
there was a pregnant pause. And then the floor gave out beneath them. If this Gorgon is not my prisoner, then who have you brought for me to seal? Azor spoke from atop his lofty, self-made throne. Before knowing Jace, Vraska had thought of sphinxes as little more than riddle-obsessed headcases who wouldn't deign to speak to something as unclean as a Gorgon. Now, though, as she kept her fear at bay by trying to locate the source of the pervasive smell of cats in the room, the shabby-looking nest of fabric and straw in the corner, which left no doubt that Azor had been in this room for a very long time, Vraska found herself thinking that the only good sphinx was a sphinx frozen in stone at the entrance to a library. We need answers more than we need him dead. Vraska bristled as she felt the Sphinx trying to pry his way around Jace's ward, which nevertheless remained firmly in place. Azor lazily turned his gaze to Jace. And here stands the Living Guild Pact. I congratulate you on not utterly destroying the system of guilds. Thank you. You're welcome. Azor spread his wings and settled on all fours. His tail was swinging lazily behind him. Roska refused to let her guard down. If you are not here with a prisoner, then I assume you are here for this. The lock of my prison, my finest creation. Azor glanced up at the ceiling. Roska's eyes followed, and the realization clicked. It was what kept them there. Not a separate enchantment, not the plane itself. Vraska's gut dropped. Why did my employer want me to steal something that locks away planeswalkers? If you are here for the immortal sun, I am afraid you are not allowed to take it. Azor's demeanor shifted, and suddenly a chill ran down Vraska's spine. The Sphinx spoke with magic resonating through every syllable. Trespassing is not allowed within the walls of Orazka. The surge of Hieromancy circumvented Jace's ward and hit Vraska all at once. A binding of glowing white runic magic grabbed hold of her torso and shoved her back toward the door behind them. Jace called out Vraska's name in surprise, and almost immediately Vraska felt Jace's magic countering the grip of Azor's Hieromancy. Vraska fell to the floor, safe behind an even stronger ward. Free from the Sphinx's spell, she shot to her feet, turning toward Azor and snarling. Your law magic can't prevent me from turning you to stone, you know. Tell us who you are, or I'll kill you where you stand. I will tell you nothing, Gorgon. Jace's eyes immediately flashed cold blue, and he held out his hand. Azor roared and pawed at his head. You will refer to her as Captain. Azor flapped his wings, and the dust of the room kicked up around them. He held his chest out in irritation, and spoke with the practiced meter of an orator. For thousands of years, I planes walk through countless worlds. Captain Vraska. They were strange and unruly, full of brutal societies plagued with violence and disorder. I used Hieromancy to give these people the gift of stability. I created systems of governance to cure them of their chaos. I selflessly toiled to improve the multiverse, and my gifts turned worlds from places of madness and brutality into structured bastions of peace. I founded countless systems of governance to shape the communal destiny of countless planes, and your rejection of my decree is most unwise. The law is meant to be followed. Vraska felt Azor's magic bounce off of and around Jace's ward. He stood defiantly and glowered at the Sphinx. We know you built the structure of guilds on Ravnica. I'm guessing you weren't from there. Why didn't you stay? The law is meant to be followed! 
Jace grimaced. An even stronger wave of Azor's law magic assaulted Jace's defensive with the fierceness of a battering ram. Why didn't you stay? Azor roared, giving up on trying to get through Jace's ward. The room went quiet and still. The Sphinx crossed his paws in annoyance. Because Ravnica was one of many, and I left when I was finished. He flicked his wings, trying another tactic. You are talented, living guild pact. Have you upheld your responsibilities well at home? A diversion. Vraska opened her mouth to get this confrontation back on track. No, I have not. Vraska's train of thought vanished. Jace was safe behind his psychic barriers, and yet still entirely vulnerable. His voice betrayed his unease with himself. Azor, you built an incredibly intricate system, with magic more complex than any one person could readily understand, and yet you made your failsafe a living mortal. Even if I had gift for governance, I would not be able to accomplish the task I've been burdened with. Jace's shoulders fell. Roska didn't know what to say to his admission. Azor merely puffed his chest. The guilds are a perfect system. The guilds were a perfect system. But the guilds have turned malicious and cruel in your absence. And whose fault is that? I gave Ravnikad skills just as I gave countless other worlds other perfect systems of law and governance. This Sphinx may have lived a thousand lifetimes longer than her, but he was a fool, a cruel patriarch. Azor was entirely unaware of the consequences of his interference. Vraska's fists were balled at her sides. I don't think you have the authority to speak of flaws when you manipulated planes that were not yours, only to abandon them when you wanted to move on to the next. Azor sat up, chin high, claws ever so slightly extended. If my governments, my gifts, soured, the fault lies with the citizens. Then what about that? Vraska's finger pointed at the immortal sun lodged in the ceiling. Was Ixalan one of your efforts as well? Azor's claws were fully extended now. What does it do? Vraska ignored the blossoming realization that she was not quite ready for a physical confrontation with a giant sphinx. Azor began to step down from his throne. Both Vraska and Jace tensed at his approach. As caretaker and arbiter of law for the entirety of the multiverse, it was my duty to collaborate for the greater good. The Immortal Sun was built to imprison one specific enemy. It amplifies the magical abilities of whoever touches it, and it prevents planeswalkers from leaving a plane. The perfect cage for a diabolical planeswalker. I gave up my spark to help create the Immortal Sun, the lock of my prison, my greatest gift to all living things. What evil were you trying to imprison? A fiend who was a danger to all the multiverse. Our plan, naturally, was perfect, but my friend failed. Our plan? So you made it with someone else? He was my friend. He was supposed to help me get back my spark after our plan worked, which it did not. So your friend helped make the Immortal Sun and then abandoned you? Vraska was desperate for more information from the slightly batty and clearly bitter Sphinx. He was to lure our foe to a faraway plane, and I was to use the Immortal Sun to enhance my Hieromancy and summon that foe here, to Ixalan. But I never received the signal to activate the Immortal Sun. I do not know my associate's fate. We devised the plan over a thousand years ago, and I came to Ixalan a little over a hundred years after that. He failed. I do not know what happened, but my execution was perfect. Vraska resisted the urge to hurl herself out the nearest window. He's been cooped up on this plane for a thousand years. I did not want anything to do with the Immortal Sun. 
and was a reminder of my friend's failure. So I decided to give the gift of governance to this plane. Ixalan was to be ruled by whoever possessed the immortal sun, and I initially gifted it to a monastery in the east in Torizon. But they were not worthy, so I took it back and gifted it to others. The Sun Empire was not worthy. The River Heralds, as evidenced by the awakening of Araska, were not worthy. Only I am worthy, and so I must work further to perfect this system. By blaming others for the problems you caused? I have been planning. If I am not able to continue to perfect the multiverse, then I can still do it here. I can fix Ixalan. How can you be so blind to the damage you've caused? The outburst upset the Sphinx. Azor tucked his ears back and frowned. It is not the system that is faulty. It is the people. The last few centuries on this plane have been chaos because of your intervention. I fixed this plane. This plane was never broken. Azor roared, spread his wings, and launched himself toward her. Jace brought up a shroud of invisibility around himself and Vraska. As they both spun away to dodge the Sphinx's charge, Vraska unsheathed her sword and cut a long, thin line across Azor's back leg. The Sphinx roared with pain and landed, sweeping wildly around him with his wings. Reveal yourself! Vraska felt Jace lift their camouflage. Jace's eyes glowed with power, and Vraska could feel him reach past his own psychic ward and manipulate Azor's mind, sending the feeling of a piercing migraine through the Sphinx's head. Azor gasped. Jace caught his breath and looked to Vraska. Are you hurt? No, but I'd love to petrify him before he tries that again. He does not deserve death. He deserves punishment. She stepped forward alongside Jace and stared down at the Sphinx. Your life was spent fixing what you saw as problems on other planes. And you meddled with business that was not yours. I am the Arbiter of Law! Jace gripped his fist and Azor groaned in pain. Let. Her. Talk. The Sphinx struggled to lift his head, but was too disoriented by Jace's spell. The Immortal Sun has spawned hundreds of years of conflict on this plane. It led the Legion of Dust to conquer an entire continent. It caused the Sun Empire and the River Heralds to mercilessly wage war upon one another. Your artifact unbalanced an entire plane, and yet you refuse to be held accountable. Vraska knelt next to Azor. The wars on this plane are on your head, and the prison where I suffered needlessly on Ravnica, where my people were subjugated, was ultimately of your making. She leaned closer and hissed, eyes glinting gold. You deserve punishment. A leader cannot abandon their responsibilities. Captain. Vraska looked to him. Jace's face was unreadable, eyes distant, his mouth a firm line. I think I need to do this. Vraska blinked, uncertain of what he meant. Do you want to punish him? He stared back. Vraska watched a specter of uncertainty and then resolution pass across his face. He nodded. It's my responsibility to act on behalf of Ravnica. Very well. She stepped away to watch. Jace approached, and the roles shifted, as if players on a stage had passed around their scripts. Where once stood a conqueror, there was now a convict. An assistant, now a judge. The living guild pact stared at the paran of the Azorius, and spoke with the wisdom and earnestness of the Jace Vraska knew well. The Living Guild Pact maintains balance between the guilds of Ravnica. You, Azor, Parn of the Azorius, are an inherent part of Ravnica, and have caused imbalance not just on my home, but on countless other planes. 
Vraska stood still and listened. Azor was quivering, cowering like a kitten. He could have fought, could have tackled Jace on the spot. But there was deeper magic at work. A powerful level of hieromancy Vraska could not see or understand that kept the Sphinx in check. The evocation of status had halted Azor in his tracks, and he listened with wide, round eyes to his sentencing. Jace, meanwhile, did not try to tower over Azor. He did not try to physically dominate or intimidate. His posture was calm and measured, his eye contact constant. This was an act of humility, of accepting something he never asked for. Not only did you decide it was your place to govern what was not yours, you also never stopped to consider the consequences of your actions. Ixalan is in peril. Ravnica was built to be unstable after you departed, and countless other worlds have likely suffered from your deliberate intervention. Whatever your intentions were, you did not seek to understand the full ramifications of your choices. Our intention was to imprison Nicol Bolas. Vraska's jaw fell open. She glanced at Jace, who seemed to be frozen still. His eyes were wide with realization, fingers still in the air before him. Vraska recognized Jace's expression as the same one from the riverbank. She could see the whites of his eyes and the quiver of his lip. A brief image flashed in her mind. She shivered. He just remembered Nicobolas. He knows him after all. Azor, may I see how you know who he is? From anyone else, the question would have been awe or misspoken. But this was a telepath's phrasing. Roska's heart beat furiously in her chest. The Sphinx's lip quivered as he considered Jace's request. Yes. Jace closed his eyes, and Roska watched as he gently, delicately, poured his senses into Azor's mind. She realized he remembered Alhamarit's teachings and wondered how it felt to peel open the mind of a sphinx. Jace glanced at Vraska. His eyes were alight with power, but his brows creased in confusion and terror. She knew that whatever he was seeing was bad news. Thank you, Azor. He stood taking a moment to compose himself and think through whatever evidence he had just seen. After a few seconds, he let out a shuddering sigh. <sighs> Your intentions were noble, but the effect of the Immortal Sun on Ixalan has been catastrophic. You and the Immortal Sun are a danger to the stability of this plane. A strange haze of blue magic shifted across the Sphinx's head, vanishing as quickly as it had appeared. Jay stepped away, the magic in his eyes gone, and spoke with the authority of the Guild Pact. Vraska felt a chill run down her neck as he spoke, and realized for the first time just how much power that position carried. You will be the master and caretaker of Useless Island. You will not be able to leave and you will never meddle in the lives of sentient beings ever again. Leave the immortal son here and depart with your life. As the Living Guild Pact, that is my decree. The invocation of Ravnican magic around the Parun of the Azorius lifted Jace's words, and Vraska felt a strange, foreign rush of law magic ringing in his voice. Azor blinked. Vraska snuffed out the petrification spell she had kept charged throughout the meeting. Azor spread his wings, which spanned the width of the throne room. He beat them, rose into the air, and flew out the door Vraska and Jace had entered through without another word. His silhouette vanished above the canopy in the distance. He was gone. Vraska looked up at the immortal sun, uncertain how she felt about it now. Why does Nicobolas want an artifact that imprisons planeswalkers? Jace's lips were a stern line, and he looked at her with dread. Vraska, you need to know who you're working for.
Thank you for listening to this production of Voice of All. As listener-supported entertainment, we rely on you not just for the voices of the characters, but also to keep us going and growing. If you enjoyed what you heard, please support us by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, or following us on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play, or just plain sharing with your friends. You can also support us financially on Patreon for exclusive perks. The Arbiter of Law Left Chaos in His Wake was written by the Magic Narrative team. The podcast was produced and edited by Gendo Okeshi with sound editing by Grace Noir. This week's story featured the voice talents of Caitlin Buckley, Rachel Toiba, Ryan Yoshitani, Derek J. Barbie, Ash Thurman, Sidney Stoffel, J.W. Forsyth, Rian Kilfeather, Isa Martell, and Maxi Bridgewood. Magic the Gathering is copyright Wizards of the Coast. Thank y'all so much for listening. Y'all have a great day. <laughs>